all the esteemed members present here, Namaskar and good evening. I, Dr. Vranda Jain, on behalf of ICSSR, welcome you to the fourth lecture under the ICSSR Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav lecture series. As part of the celebrations of the 75th year of Indian independence, ICSSR has initiated a series of lectures to review the achievements of India and the prospects of future in various fields of social, economic, scientific, and technological endeavor by the leaders in the respective fields. I humbly request the chief guest, Padmum Bhushan, Professor Chairperson, Board of Governors, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, Padm Shri, Professor J.K. Bajaj, Chairman ICSSR, and Professor Deepak Kumar Shivasta, Member Secretary ICSSR, to grace the occasion with their benign presence on the dais. I request Professor Deepak Shivasta, sir, to extend a floral welcome to Professor Radha Krishnanji. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a proud privilege and an honor to introduce a technocrat par excellence, a dynamic and result-oriented manager, an astute institution builder, an able and diligent administrator, and an inspiring leader. Born on August 29, 1949, Dr. Radhakrishnan is an electrical engineer, a postgraduate diploma in management, and a doctorate in the area of Indian Earth Observation System. So I started his career as an avionics engineer in Vikram Sarabhai Space Center and held several decisive positions in ISRO in the domains of space launch systems, space applications, and space program management. Sir has held the post of director, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, which is the lead center for launch vehicle technology in ISRO, and director, National Remote Sensing Agency. Sir has been the chairman of Indian Space Commission, secretary of the Department of Space, and chairman of ISRO from 2009 to 2015. As the chief of ISRO, Sir is known to have a spearheaded team ISRO, executing 31 space missions in the five years of his term, which is an unprecedented accomplishment in the history of ISRO. Under his able leadership, India's space capabilities in satellite navigation, strategic communications, microwave radar imaging, and tropical climate studies were greatly strengthened. Also, it was under his leadership that India's first planetary exploration, the Mars Orbiter mission, was conceived, planned, and executed. His contributions over the last 43 years in the domain of space engineering and applications have strengthened India's strategic capability in space and uh, the technological development of the country and its people while enhancing the stature of India in international arena. His biography, My Odyssey, Memoirs of the Man Behind the Mangalyaan Mission was published in 2016. I now request Honorable Member Secretary, Professor Deepak Shivastav, sir, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you. Good evening. Respected Professor K. Radhakrishnan Ji, the speaker of today's Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsa lecture series at ISR. Honorable Chairman, ISR. Dr. J.K. Bajaj, Paramadraniya, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi Ji, Jitke Garma Mai Upastiti, Bhoti Hamlo Ko Prerna Deti Hai, Distinguished Guests and Friends. A warm welcome to you to this evening for sparing some of your valuable time to listen to one of the great luminary of uh, space science. Normally, uh, uh, in, in normal way, sometimes when something is very difficult or something is not difficult, if something is not difficult, normally we say it's not a rocket science. So it means 
that rocket science is a something which is beyond social sciences. So I'm from social sciences, so I don't know much of the rocket science because it's meant only for very, very highly intelligent and intellectual person like our uh, guest today, Professor Radha Krishnan ji. Today's session is basically on the topic 60 years of Indian space program and prospects for the next 10. I will present to you uh, while welcoming uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan ji and other guests, I will present to you some of the views that pr probably as a social scientist or social sciences person I carry with me. Uh, I may be excused if I'm not correct to the extent of the uh, maybe expectations. The year 2022 marks the 60th anniversary of India's space endeavor. India's space program has come a long way from its modest beginning in 1962 to successful missions to Moon and Mars. The country has mastered the technologies required to design, assemble, and launch satellites for all purposes. Having developed its space program indigenously in a period of technology following the nuclear test, it has active collaborations with most space-faring nations today. The father of the Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, specified why he believed India should be investing in space. According to Dr. Sarabhai, space played a critical role in nation's development and led to scientific progress, something India could not but invest in for its overall national development, Dr. Sarabhai stated, I quote, there are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. To us, there is no ambiguity of purpose. We do not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or the planets or manage the space flight. But we are convinced that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society." Unquote. In this era of innovations in a space journey, scientists are exploring the space galaxy, planets by planets, and reaching out to stars and stars it's noteworthy to mention here about Isro's Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan missions, followed by single shoot achievement of putting 104 satellites into its orbit by a single mission and creating world record. Not only we are happy with these achievements, but also the whole world is amazed and happy with these achievements in the space. Isro is, is stepping into its dream vision of putting man in space through the Gaganyaan mission and the whole nation can be proud of its efforts. Here I would like to quote a phrase by Sri Swami Vivekanandji, and I quote, take up one idea, make that one idea your life, think of it, dream of it, and live on that idea. Let the brain, muscles, nerves, and every part of your body be full of that idea, and just leave every other idea alone. This is the way to success, unquote. India is a major space power in Asia with global implications. India invests approximately $1.8 billion in space annually, helped by its low labor and manufacturing cost and low cost launches. With more than 400 companies in the sector, India has about 3.6% of the world's space tech companies, which have attracted US dollar 2.6 billion in investment making India the seventh country in the terms of investment in space sector companies. The sector counts over 100 starts up today, developing and manufacturing component systems, launch vehicles and provide satellite-based communication and imaging services, among others. The Swiss aero aerospace industry has been a regular supplier to the Indian space program. The Indian space program will remain a powerful expression of Indian nationalism, its way of seeking prestige globally as well as inspirational to its people. With these words, I once again welcome uh, our guest today, uh, Professor Radha Krishnan, 
and invite him for the uh, for the session uh, today for th for the benefit of the larger audience sitting here or and we will be maybe sharing these thoughts with others also thank you very much sir good evening to all the dignitaries present here i am humbled by the presence of most respected dr murli manohar joshi ji during this course of discussion i will tell you some points where he has kindled the leaders of indian space program to create a point of inflection in the space program and i thank dr bajaj for this kind invitation and probably india is the only country where space science and social science co exist in the same same room and dr shrivastava gave a beautiful summary of the space program and how it matters for a country like india and how it has given india a place of pride in the global community when we talk about space program essentially there are three parts of it one is the space research helps us to learn more about humanity that's one dimension of space the other dimension space helps us to help the humanity better and if you look at the indian space program the way it originated in the year 1962 it was kindled by the first part of it the space science where dr sarabhai was invited by dr baba to start this program and if you look at his vision that is spelt out in the year 1968 it's essentially an instrument to help the humanity and that made india different from all other major space powers of the day and in this process he also said we should be self reliant and that has raised the level of science and technology in this country this has been and this is and this is going to be the founding pillars of indian space program for the past 60 years and for the decades to come the two founding fathers of indian space program if i say that is dr vikram sarabhai and professor sadish thawan these two legendaries heading the space program in that sequence has made all the difference for india and for isro dr vikram sarabhai was an inspiring leader a multifaceted personality and what he gave to india is an indomitable vision for the space program that was just now spelt out and the spirit of self reliance even though in the post liberalized india there was a soft option many times to go for imported systems to meet the requirement we believe he and billy believed in the philosophy that we should be self reliant we felt ashamed when our systems had to fly with imported systems and dr sarabhai brought many inspired teams in ahmedabad in bombay and in tiruvannantapuram i had the fortune to be part of isro when dr vikram sarabhai was the director of the space science and technology center at tumba and he had several vibrant institutions the tumba equatorial rocket launching station where dr kalam was one of the major pillars we had the rocket fabrication facility rocket propellant plant space science and technology center the sri harikota launch range and in ahmedabad several ground stations and development programs on applications and he wanted to see how developmental communication could be done through satellite systems all this happened at that time so several initiatives in this area came at that time and the pet subject of 
sounding rockets being used for the experiments devised by scientists from NPL or TIF or and PR. All this happened at that time. The unfortunate event happened in the year 1971, December 30th. And then we saw a major change. Professor Sadish Thawan, who had already been inducted into the Atomic Energy Commission by Dr. Sarabhai, was requested to take charge. And he came with a vision. He shaped this organization. He built this organization. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai inducted Sadish Thawan into the space program. And Sadish Thawan, for the next 12 years, executed this program with Elan. And he said, it was Vikram's vision, I only executed it. Rarely you find a successor making such a statement. And that's why I said in the beginning, these two legendaries coming in that sequence made all the difference. Their outlook, their character, that shape. So almost 20 years of shaping ISRO. And what have they finally given to us? As an organization, the Troika model of governance that you see in space program in the country, the Space Commission for policy making, the Department of Space, which ensures the parliamentary accountability, public accountability, and ISRO as a vibrant organization for executing the programs, all headed by the same person, without mixing the roles, like a driver uses accelerator, clutch, and brake. This has been one of the reasons for the success of the space program. Restructuring and consolidation. In 1971, we had several small institutions and came the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center in Tiruvannandapuram, headed by another legendary person, Dr. Brahma Prakash, who was a senior professor in Indian Institute of Science when Professor Sadish Thawan just entered there as an assistant professor. And the senior person sitting as director of his center and the then junior person sitting as the chairman showed to us how two great persons could work together as a team, an ideal model of partnership. This is what we saw in these two persons. There was something to learn for us. Then came the program strategy focus. There were three pillars on which the space program got initiated. First and foremost, demonstrate that space can be used for several applications. Hired satellite and the teams in Ahmedabad showed that it can be used for broadcasting, developmental communication, telecommunication, etc. Build satellites. That was the beginning of Aryabhatta with support from the then Soviets. Professor Yuarao started that program. Then came the long lead item of rocket science, the SLV-3 project. This strategy and this sequence had all that relevance. Entire ISRO was galvanized to do these three activities. And if you ask me one reason for the success of ISRO, it is this focus. Our goalposts are very clear, well-chosen goalposts, everyone in the organization are with it, and then the nation has been with us and we executed that. Satellites, rocket science, all these things are there. But it has to be relevant and significant for the nation. That is where the national space systems got their relevance. In sat satellite was conceived along with all the user agencies, telecommunication, broadcasting, and meteorology community. A three-in-one satellite was built. And at the same time, all these secretaries were part and parcel of the management of INSAT satellite system. The INSAT coordination committee decided what kind of satellite has to be there, and they put money. They took responsibility. Each one of them did one part of it. The satellite segment was done by ISRO. The communication part of it was taken by DOT. The INB took care of the transponders for broadcasting. And the then civil aviation, 
and later DST, he took care of the meteorology part of it. Probably this was the only nation in the world at that time where the users were part and parcel of conceiving and building a satellite system and operating that satellite system. Soon came the remote sensing community spread around the whole country in the center as well as in the states for looking at several types of natural resources. They all came together under the umbrella of planning commission. And then they said, yes, we will have an operational remote sensing satellite system. And also, we will have capacity building in the central agencies and the state governments to make use of that. This interlinking of the user requirements, the user agencies, and the satellite builders was something great. When the PSLV project was being conceived, Professor Sadhish Dhawan told ISRO, the satellite that will be launched by PSLV will be decided based on the requirements of Agricultural Ministry. Agricultural Ministry at that time represented one of the major users of the satellite system. So this is something which came up in ISRO. Space industry. Professor Sadish Thawain in 1970 he told every one of us, if industry can do something, ISRO will not invest in that facility. A leverage on the capacity of the industry and the engineering methods of industry in fabricating things. So for Aryabhatta, for SLV3, they became major partners. Today we have 400 plus firms and of course they have gone further ahead. So this is one part of it. Academia, of course a great academician, he believed that he should kindle the academic community the professor, a PhD student, and he called that program RESPOND, which started at that time. Innovative systems, I will talk about it later. And seamlessly, the leadership of the organization was passed on to his successor, Professor Yuvar Rao. So this is the basic phase of shaping ISRO. And the strides in space technology, if you look at over the three phases of it. Initially, we started with a very small program of making sounding rockets at Tumba and experiments using those rockets. But soon, we had three phases of program. The site and Apple program led by Professor Yeshpal from Ahmedabad. Aryabhata and the other satellite program led by Professor Yuvar Rao and the SLV-3 led by Dr. Abdul Kalam. This was the first step where from a sounding rocket which went like a projectile, we started making satellites, putting them into an orbit around Earth. And we saw the next generation of leaders who came forward to make operational launchers, the ASLV, which really taught us a lot of lessons about rocket science. We had recurrent failures in ASLV. And then we learned several lessons which became useful for subsequent missions. The IRS-1 satellite, for the first time, India became the third nation in the world to have an operational remote sensing satellite system. Landsat of US, Spot Satellite of France, and then IRS of India. And what could talk about it on a comparative basis as almost equal to it. Then came, in the year 1995, the best civilian remote sensing satellite came from India, IRS-1C and IRS-1D. And in the globe, we had 20 ground stations receiving data from IRS-1C on a commercial basis. So this was a turning point in Indian space program. The first generation of INSAT satellites were built abroad. But the INSAT 2 satellites in the 1990s came from ISRO, from Ahmedabad, the payloads came from Bangalore, the satellites came. Of course, they were heavy satellites. We had to launch from abroad. 
we see here a point of inflection. And I should narrate to you a story which I heard from Dr. Kasur Rangan. In every presentation of Chairman Isro, there used to be a slide at the end. What will be the capacity, capability of PSLV and GSLV for putting a satellite around Moon or Mars? It used to be an academic slide, essentially, as a conclusion. But it seems in one of the presentations, Honorable Minister at that time, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi was there. And it seems he asked, why not? That why not question gave birth to a study group being formed. And that project was named at that time Somayan, which was later rechristened by the Honorable Prime Minister Bajpayee as Chandrayaan 1. And he said 1 because this is a beginning, not an end. That was an inflection point. And in the year 2008, we had a satellite put around moon using our PSLV. One point here, Sarabhai's vision was shared by the organization, but we did not remain stale. As the capability enhanced, as our aspirations went up, as the world changed, we also changed, we advanced. So Chandrayaan was our first major inflection point in our program. Then came, of course, satellites with better capability, whether it is remote sensing satellites or communication satellites. But we also got into a new technology, which is the cryogenic technology. We wanted to put our communication satellites into geostationary orbit using our own launches. And we required a cryogenic stage, which has a better efficiency, if I put it in very crude language. There was an issue at that time in the year 1992 where Russia could not give us a technology, but the grit and determination of Professor U.R. Rao, then chairman at that time, that we will do it. Of course, it took us 18 years to do that, but we not only did that for GSLV, we developed a more powerful cryogenic stage for the next mission, that is LVM-3. You would have seen a month ago we had the launch of one web satellites. A system where, because of geopolitical conditions, they could not launch it from Russia. And our GSLE, or the LVM-3 as we call it now, was made ready in six months. And we launched those satellites successfully. And there is a first commercial launch of our advanced launch vehicle, LVM-3. This is how the systems and the people have been geared up to look at things. We also had the new program for the navigation, that is the NAVIC program. Till now, from the sounding rocket space, space science was a piggyback on some of the satellites. And then came the dedicated satellite, AstroSat. In the year 2012, in the COSPAR, that is, all the scientific personnel in the world who look at space science came together and they told AstroSat is going to be a great asset for the global space astronomy community. And it is continuing to be so. So when there is James Webb Telescope or Hubble Telescope, etc., there, we have our own contribution as AstroSat with instruments built by our own scientific community from TAFR, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, etc., etc. Chandrayaan-1 emboldened us. We can go further. So in the year 2010, of course, that's the time when ISRO was going through recurrent failures of GSLV. We decided that we will target for Mangalyaan, Mars mission. And if you look at the Mars orbiter missions of Russia or US, first 51 missions conducted by these agencies had a large amount of failures, almost more than 50% failures. So we were not disheartened, but 
we learn from those failures, whatever is available in the public parlor. We also learn from our own successes and failures. And of course, that grit is there. Devotion is there. We decided we are going to do it in the next available slot. And missions to Mars can be there only once in 26 months. And in the year 2010, June, ISRO looked at two options, whether we can just fly by Mars or whether we can venture for an orbiter. So all directors sat together and we decided that, yes, we should look at orbiter. No soft option. We had a study group of almost 100 scientists, engineers, and they came up with a report in one year's time. Report such that our PSLV can be cleverly used for this mission. And it is possible to avail the next possible opportunity, which was November 2013. We said, we will do it. Let us try. And we had Professor U.R. Rao at that time advising us on the space science. And he was with us, and he also got the scientific community to put some instrument. If we are able to orbit, what should be done? It was a technology mission. The methodology of getting into an orbit of Mars. It, there are a lot of challenges. That is number one. As an organization, everyone felt that this is a once-in-lifetime opportunity. We should do it. If you make it, yes, put all the efforts, and we made it. So this was another major achievement into planetary mission beyond lunar. Human spaceflight, if you look at Dr. Sarabhai's initial vision, he did not talk about human spaceflight. That was in the 60s. But time is ripe now for us to get into the next phase, human spaceflight. Studies were there from the year 2004 onwards. And a few years ago, 2018, August 15, the announcement came that we are going to have our Gaganyan program. And that process is on at the moment. In the year 2020 came a very major transition point for us, the space sector reforms, where the private sector, rather than becoming jobbing partners with ISRO, they were elevated to the level of being passengers along with ISRO in the space endeavor of the nation. They were emboldened, they were empowered to do that with systems and institutional arrangements, like in space. And ISRO, which was doing research and development, as well as operational satellites, launches, operations, all got into two compartments. One focus on research and development, other one produce the rockets along with industry, operate them. The NSIL, a public sector institution. This restructuring happens during that period. So this has been the voyage till 2022 on technology. The USP of Indian space program, as I mentioned, essentially has been space applications. The users were always in loop for the decision making on what satellites should be built, what payload should be there, and how many should be there. Capacity building ensured that they were ready to use the satellite systems as and when we put it. And it is not that ISRO does these activities. They should have institutions within themselves to use it. Today, you go to the forest ministry. They have got National Forest Data Management Center in Dharadu. If you look at ocean, there's Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services. And I should say, Honorable Minister was there. That's the time I moved out from space to INCOIS to be its founder director. And we have in Delhi the Mahalanobi Center for National Crop Forecasting. We have got the water resource information system in CWC. All these institutions were created in the central agencies. Every state in this country who manage the land, they have a state remote sensing application center. Some of them even have gone up to national level, like BISAC in Gandhinagar. 
So this is how ISRO strive to externalize the space application and making it part and parcel of the value chain of the user community. And there are several areas in which we have made great inroads. Revolution in the communication infrastructure through the INSAT satellite system, the data connectivity and the broadcasting and education. And as technology advanced, we also advanced with the DTH satellites at one point of time. Today it's all HTS, that is the high throughput satellite system for broadband connectivity and rural communication. Monitoring natural resources was a starting point, meteorological observations using INSAT system. And today if you look at any cyclone over the last uh, one decade, there is precise forecasting by India Meteorology Department, essentially making use of satellite data on the movement of the cyclonic system. And of course, discerning environment and climate is one of the priorities today, and the sustainable development goals. The navigation satellite system, if you take globally, we have the GPS system, which is synonymous with navigation, the GLONASS system of Russia. Then we have Galileo system of Europe, and India decided that we should have assured navigation signals. And that is why we decided to have our own regional navigation system, which is christened as NAVIC. And the combination of communication, remote sensing, and navigation helps us to have location-based services. And also for the disaster management, it has become part and parcel of the national system. The space community work in tandem with the Ministry of Home Affairs and all the state governments in the event of any disaster. And the sustainable development planning, this is one area where I also personally work. How geospatial data can be used by the people at the grassroots level to prepare the development plans, essentially at the level of CEO of every district. So we have made great inroads. And I should say, when we go to several places, our scientists get respect, not for Mangalyan or the rockets, but how it is useful for the people. If you look at the discussions in the various committees involving parliamentarians, this is an area where it is close to their heart, how it can be used for people, for the land management, for the water resource management, for disaster management. So this is what ISRO or Indian Space Program has done to meet the original vision of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai that it should be used for the betterment of the people. Program is one thing. But what is that organization and the culture that has been developed? In fact, this is going to be our investment for the future. First and foremost, there is a shared vision, as I mentioned, from Dr. Sarabhai onwards, for all the leaders and down the line for all the people. So whenever a decision is taken on any technology development, uppermost in our mind is whether it will fit into that vision. And of course, how we en enrich that vision. What is the national priority if you are in some islands of excellence in our own world? We are not going to be looked at with respect by anybody and we won't be supported with the resources. But it's so always decided that we should be there where there is a problem for the nation. In 1987, with the recurrent droughts, Professor Yuvara, who was chairman at that time, the whole attention of the organization was how we'll be able to use space systems to help them. And that is how all our activities on geospatial planning and sustainable development, everything that came. Transparency and accountability from the beginning. We don't conceal. Our failures are known to people. Our successes are known to people. Our problems are known to people. This trust we have been able to develop and sustain. And Professor Dhawan, when he took over the ISRO's budget was about 30 crores. 
at that time. He, he said 30 crores is a big amount of money by the taxpayers and we are accountable to them. And that is inbuilt in our system. Of course, ISRO works as a team. It is not the place for individual excellence and say that I did. It is what as a team we deliver, which makes all the difference. So when we see a rocket being launched, at least 500 people will be there in the operation at Shiheri Kota. And a few thousands would have worked over the past three, four years to make that happen. A mistake by anyone at any level, even at the level of a tradesman, would, could make it failure. But they all put their heart and they do their best. Of course, sometimes we fail also. Techno-managerial decision-making system in ISRO came from the Senate system of Indian Institute of Science. Democratic decision-making process where everyone has a voice to express their views and to criticize. But once the decision is taken, everyone follows that decision. And probably ISRO is the only organization where a junior person will chair a meeting and all the seniors will sit there. From the Space Commission down the line to any meeting, this is a common thing. And of course, we have empowered project management system, evolved from the SLV3 days onwards to deal with large projects, where all centers participate and our schedules are all tough schedules. We create our schedules and then we try to meet that. Before any rocket is launched, any satellite is launched, we go through a thorough review, technical review. X does the design, but Y of equal competence will sit and review that system. It's the responsibility of X to present it and also take the comments on board. Initially in the 70s, people were thinking why? Who is there to review my design. But then people found if somebody else go through that of the same competence, all hidden problems could come out and it is better for the system. So this is part and parcel of our process and thinking. And of course, we fail many times, we have failed and failure resilience is something that is always there. Generally, we have seen the leader takes the responsibility for failures. And when there is a success, the credit is passed on to the team. This has happened. We believe in two things, system reliability and quality. Similarly, safety of the systems. We don't compromise on this. The moment we compromise, the moment we overrule these two functionaries, we had it. And this is something which we follow. In fact, I was talking to Professor Agarwal just before this session. He is one of the person who has been participating in this activity in the formative stage in ISRO. And we, this is one of the strong points of ISRO. Of course, when we talk about human space flight, which will be talked about for the next couple of years in a very seen major way, there are new challenges. You can put through LVM3 about 10 tons into a lower orbit. That is good for carrying human beings. But there are several challenges when we put a human being on board, take them safely there, keep them safely there for a week or so, and bring them back safely. In all these phases, there are challenges. In the event of any failure that is likely to occur in the launch vehicle from the launch pad to the orbit, we should be able to sense and identify that well in advance, diagnose that, and then take these crew members far away from that point of disaster. The crew escape system at different points of the flight. So this is one of the challenge. If a rocket is going to take only a satellite, it can be of a lesser level of reliability compared to when we take a human being into that, like a cargo aircraft and a passenger aircraft. We talk about reliabilities of 0 0.99, etc. here. Another part of it is when the 
human being is in the crew module, the environment that we create for them, that we assure for them, and all changes that will take place in the human body during that phase of travel and stay in the orbit. This has to be understood. And more importantly, they are going to be taking the decision on navigating that craft where their own life is at stake. There is a psychological aspect to it that we should take care of. Then the other part of it is physics as we re-enter. What happens to the crew module as it comes down and gets into the 100, 120 kilometers of atmosphere, the heating? How do we manage that? And finally, how, where it will land, where it will land safely, and how do we recover? These are all part of the challenges that Kaganyan is going through at the moment. And possibly, in a couple of years, we'll have a series of tests to ensure. Kaganyan is going to put human beings, two or three maximum, around the Earth for a week or so. What is the next step? One can look at moon. It's happening today elsewhere in the world. And people are also talking about habitat in Mars. Of course, it takes 1,000 days to go there and come back. Whether the human endurance will tolerate that, these are all being studied. Space robotics is something which is quite important. Lesser weightage for the human being and more weightage for a robot which can behave almost like a human being with learning or cognitive capability inbuilt into the system. So these are all the directions in which the world is going today. Where is the world going in the space arena at the moment? We call from 2018 a phase called New Space Age. 1957, people coined the word Modern Space Age. This new space age has several new things. Of course, a new breed of protagonists have come into place now. Earlier it was America, Soviet Union, China, etc., etc. Today it is Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk and such people who are investing in a major way their own money for the frontier research in space. So this has made all changes. Of course, the quest for enriching the knowledge is there. Today, we also talk about how to exploit the resources from the celestial bodies. Solar power has been there always. Today, we talk about asteroid mining. There has been a mission elsewhere for looking at asteroids. Habitat in space, there are countries who envision that maybe 100 years from now, there could be habitat in Mars. And before that, there could be habitat in Moon. So these are all part of that process. Exponential advance in technology is something happening all over the world. In our time, five years we could manage without much of updating. But today, in six months, we will become obsolete if we are not up to date. And it is going to happen. We talk about disruptions in technology. These have advantages for the space, also competitions. There is growing commercial space enterprise. Today we talk about a global space economy of about 440 billion US dollars. And if you look at the contribution of it, about 75% come from commercial space operations. In the beginning when there were only a very few countries participating in space, today at least there are 70 to 80 nations having active space program at least applications program, or operating the satellite systems. So everyone is into that business. With the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG, with our issues related to climate change and trying to understand that part of it, and the disaster management of different types, there is new needs that has emerged. World is quite different from bipolar world. We got into multipolar worlds, and there are new tensions around and space for surveillance, space for security, it has become important. Security of space assets, that's again becoming important. Today there are at least 4,500 satellites in the orbit, so their security is important. 
engagement for human well-being that continues to be there while we also talk about the other uses of space today. The last point is, what is the prospect for India in space for the next 10 years? I use the term 10 years plus because it is a continuum and space requires long gestation period for planning, executing and operating. Space transportation, first and foremost, is through development. Today is at LVM3. How to get new generation heavy lift launchers? So this is one priority. And reusability of the launchers to ensure low cost access to space. And here we talk about hypersonic propulsion, air breathing, and all those technologies. Rapid space transport and logistics. Today we talk about 1,000 days if you have to go to Mars and come back. Can we have innovative systems to reduce this? On the other side, the operational launches to be produced by industry, already the industry in India, is gearing up to produce five PSLVs. That is ISRO designed launch vehicles. Can they not design launch systems? A beginning has been made. Recently there was a small rocket made by the Hyderabad team, Skyroot, that went up successfully. So industry to develop their own launch solutions. So this is a new direction. An offshoot of the space sector reforms to kindle several youngsters to get into this area. On the spacecraft, of course, navigation system has the atomic clock at its heart. Multi-purpose low Earth orbit constellations, it is there for communications today. Can we not look at a satellite having different types of payloads? And let us go back to the inside system of 1970s, where India had three in one satellite system, communication payload, broadcasting payload, and meteorological payload, all in one satellite. So this is another area in which we are going. Communication satellite technology is advancing very fast. Today we talk about 5G, where satellite has one type of role. But we are getting into 6G, where satellites are going to be essential part of that system. This is one part of it. The flexibility to be produced, because we talk about satellite systems of 10 to 15 years life, one cannot be static over 15 years. So what kind of flexibilities that we build in with the soft radio technology, etc. Security is important. So we talk about quantum technology essentially for the sending of commands. So hack-free communication satellite system with quantum technology and optical communication. Electric propulsion is another thing which is coming up in a very major way for the satellite system. If you talk about a decent high technology, high throughput satellites globally, it's about six and a half tons today. Of which about two and a half tons will go for the propellant that you carry for station keeping and orbit operations over its life. If you use electric propulsion system, the weight will come down by that much. The penalty is it may not immediately get into the geostationary orbit. It will take about six months time to get into that. But still, that is cost effective. There are electric propulsion systems which are in work in several other places. We are also into that development. Kaganyan plus what is going to happen? International Space Station is already there. There is a Chinese space station. We could think of an Indian space station. That is another area of activity for research as well as economic activity. In human space flight, manned mission to moon, and technology development for planetary habitat. This is going to be a collective activity of the humanity. And when we look at Moon, when we look at Mars, humanity is one. But if you have to be part of that team, we should have our own strength to be a partner there. Space business, this is another area. We have got fertile minds. How we could become private space park, we could create global data solutions we could provide. We could be a global manufacturing hub for the umpteen number of satellites that are required for the low Earth constellations. Space tourism is 
being talked about. Space mining from asteroids or other places. These are all the future areas in this direction. It may not be 10 years, it is 10 years plus. And what is that aspiration for us for the year 2047? The global space economy, which is at 47 billion US dollar, is going up at the rate of almost 5%. So in 2047, it could be 1,500 billion. So for in India of 2047, there are some numbers which we have put as our aspiration. First and foremost, the size of space economy from 9 billion to 675 billion. Satellite launches, seven per year today, going up to even 500. Share of private industry going from 10% to almost 90%. And the OEMs in the top hundred of the world, at least India should have about 10. No, these are all the aspirations or the broad directions in which the nation is going. I am sure India is going to have a vibrant space program with the original three things which I mentioned, looking at the humanity, helping the humanity and also raising science and technology and being a major partner in the growth. World is moving. We were six or seven from 2007. And if you have to be there, or if you have to improve in some areas as leaders, there is a long way to go. And there is a vibrant set of youngsters who are into the area now. And I'm sure the future is bright. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for an exciting and futuristic talk. I now request Honorable Chairman Professor J.K. Bajaj, sir, to present the concluding remarks. Uh, our speaker today, uh, Sri Radha Krishnan ji has uh, given us a compelling in this just about 40 45 minutes he given us a compelling detail of the vision of his organization the culture its evolution its uh, and the varied projects it is, it is created in the last 60 years and the multiplicity of organizations and institutions and users that it has interfaced with. It's been a beautiful, very compelling presentation in such a short time. Thank you very much. Uh, while I was listening to him, there were several thoughts were coming to me. And uh, one of the immediate thoughts was that, look, he's giving us a story of one part of India one aspect of India, and such a beautiful story. And uh, it should be the business of our social scientists to document this story, its various aspects. There's so much to learn and do for the social scientists in India while studying this story. And the, how the culture is evolved, how it is carried through generations, uh, how do you interface with multiple users and multiple demands. Uh, there's so many things that, that uh, social, so many books that the social scientists, uh, he himself has written a very interesting book, but there's so many books that social scientists could write on a story like that of Hisro and similar other stories. Uh, it's work to be done. It is, it's useful work is before us. Uh, Listening to him, I was also reminded of several occasions when I personally has ha have had the privilege or the opportunity to interface with uh, 
once in a while one of their leaders, but many of their applications and many of their products. I, I remember that when I was a, uh, I had just finished my PhD or was it a PhD, uh, uh, I was a high energy physicist and uh, there was a high energy physics conference. Uh, we used to have one national conference every year in Bhubaneswar. And the inaugural uh, uh, address for that conference was to be delivered by Professor Jashpal Homi Menchen, who was heading the site program at that time. And I, so everybody is very busy. So he, he was to uh, give a talk on the opening day in the morning. He came the next day in the evening. And uh, he, he gave an evening talk instead of inaugural address and showed us slides of how in different parts of India, in the remotest areas, they're trying to reach education there through their satellite program. And uh, it was a, uh, what I was impressed by about what they are doing, uh, he didn't talk much physics, uh, but also I was impressed with the passion he was displaying. And as he has told us today, uh, Professor Radhakrishna, I think in incubating that passion in everyone in the, in the team seems to be one of the specialities of ISRO. Uh, then I remember, uh, and this was a, a, a very impressive thing. I happened to be in uh, in HL for a while, and uh, uh, one of the things which they showed me they are doing is to make one of the stages of several stages. They make one of the stages of the launches, and they were so proud of doing it. And it's a very big task. The the machining, the riveting, the material handling is a huge task. And as he said, they've made it a point to transfer the, all these tasks which others can do. And uh, uh, ISTRO will be one of what you said, 4,000 or something uh, home who are making things for them. And everybody doing it is proud of contributing to a great national effort and also a great technological effort. Doing that is not a small technological effort, but both it is a great national effort and great technological effort. And then we have the DG of uh, MPCST, uh, Madhya Pradesh Council of Science and Technology sitting here. He, they are one of those centers, he said, who work with the remote sensing data uh, uh, created by, uh, produced by ISRO. And I worked with data, that data with them. And uh, it is fascinating looking at the satellite images at different levels. And they have made it, the ISRO has made it so widespread that everywhere you have access at different resolutions to this kind of data. I, I'm fortunate that I worked with those satellite images to produce what this Madhya Pradesh for several districts. Uh, we produced this resource atlases. And these satellite images were one of the major, major inputs required for doing it. Without that, I don't think any of this could have been done. And I've actually gone and met, as you said, there are the CEOs of the district, but even of the panchayat level, who are using this data for development purposes, for making plans. So uh, I'm fortunate that I have, I have interacted with this at some levels at several levels. Uh, but I think all of us, in some way or the other, are making use of or interacting with what they are doing. And in that sense, the story of ISRO is the story of a large part of India. So one was uh, that I, we must congratulate him, we must thank him for telling us this story in this brief manner with so much of information and passion. Now I come to something else. That is when I sent this invitation uh, that 
for this today's talk uh, to several of my friends from different fields. And many of them responded to me. Uh, they, many of them are not in Delhi. Uh, I, this was only to inform them. Many of them responded to me that this is going to be great because we know that uh, Radha Krishna is a great technologist and a great manager, a great scientist, but he is also a great nationalist. He has, uh, many of them wrote to me that what is most interesting is that he is, a, that is a, a very committed, great nationalist. And that also struck me because I personally believe, and I think there's some truth in it, that to do great work, one needs great purpose. And there's no greater purpose than the passion to build the nation. If you don't have that purpose, if you, if you uh, do not have nationalism, uh, there is something such a lack that is unlikely that any great work will come out of you. And this is said in different, different contexts, various people have said it. And uh, that is important. From Isro, not only him, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, or other leaders, you look at any one of them. Uh, they have the passion in their science and their technology because they have a passion for their nation. And uh, when I was thinking about it, I thought, we, the social scientists, I am perhaps an honorary social scientist. Uh, we, the social scientists, lack this. Uh, not perhaps all of it, but uh, nationalism does not form part of our work, part of our way of being, as it does for, most, uh, uh, for many of the scientists, many of the technologists. And my feeling is that uh, in the process, we are missing something. Uh, why the social scientists are somewhat, uh, uh, I don't know, like out from outside the ICSSR headquarters, I hope there are some social scientists sitting here. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, why it is, uh, my, I have been thinking about why we do not have, and this is something Joshi Ji will be interested in, why in the social sciences we do not have the same kind of nationalist streak which we find in many parts of the, not all those, but many parts of the scientific establishment, technological establishment, engineering establishment of India. And uh, uh, one is, of course, that uh, the uh, social scientists are uh, exposed to this idea that Nationalism is some kind of a parochialism, and one should be uh, one should be universal. Human humanist, uh, we should worry about humanity and the world, and not really about. But you know, in his talk, he mentioned that uh, uh, all that we do in space is universal. It is the business of all of humanity. But we can be participant in that business of humanity. If we are ourselves something, we can participate only as a, as a great nation, we can part, participate in this. And I thought, why don't the social scientists are able to get this easily? Uh, partly because, partly because uh, we, uh, most of us, uh, including me, uh, do not have access to the a great civilization literature of India, which tells you, which gives you the way of uh, seeing how uh, you integrate your particular nationalism, particular feeling of being the son of this great nation or daughter of this great nation with the good of the whole humanity. The way somebody like Pandit Dindyal Upadhyaya would have been able to do in his that small book, uh, Ekat Manavad. He is where he is trying to tell us how to integrate being Indian with being 
universal. Uh, the Indian uh, knowledge, uh, the Indian uh, civilization really does offer the, us that opportunity to be able to, but most of do, us do not have access to that, that literature. We are, not, we are not really familiar with that literature. That I thought is perhaps one of the reasons why we cannot invoke the, do not see the kind of nationalism amongst the social scientists which permeates the rest of I'm sorry, you will be getting bored because I'm talking no. to social scientists. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk to social scientists. <laughs> uh, uh, and then they, uh, there's another issue. I think because the social scientists of India uh, have largely uh, learned their sociological, philosophical, psychological concepts from the Western tradition. And uh, they really do not find, when they look at the Indian ideas, concepts, and structures, the way the, an Indian community behaves, or the way an Indian person behaves, or Indian social group behaves, uh, they find it weird because it doesn't seem to fit in the, the, the concepts and uh, ideas and uh, that they've learned, we have learned from the, the West. It seems, uh, in that it seems odd from those. So we, we, in Indian structures, we find errors. It looks all erroneous when you look at it from that uh, perspective. And uh, I think we get confused. And so we, we stand, India is moving. There's a great stream. Uh, one part of that stream, one part of the river is the uh, stream of Isro. There are the agriculture people. There are the atomic energy people. There are the aeronautical people. There are different streams adding to that great river. But we social scientists are not even looking at those streams. We seem to be standing on the banks and wondering is me kya galat hai, us me kya galat hai, ye ho bhi raha hai ya nahi ho raha. I think, I, I don't know, I have been given the opportunity to deal, work with social scientists, engage with social scientists as this apex social science organization. And I am not presenting this as a, as a criticism. This is a problem. And I think we should, uh, uh, engage with each other to get this uh, problem resolved so that we, the social scientists of India, are become the part of the story of India and not uh, uh, bystanders are looking at it from some perspective, which may be correct, may not be correct. But uh, the beauty is in becoming the part, part of the flow. And uh, I hope uh, we can we can engage in this uh, these, uh, this discussion in a more. I was also wondering that can I ask some some great social scientists of India and ask him to come and review the contribution of social sciences in the last seventy five years and what we are expecting in the future. I was wondering who will be able to tell us what was the vision of social sciences? Who was the Vikram Sarambhai of India? Uh, Vikram Sarambhai of social sciences. Uh, and do we have a vision? Do we have a culture? Uh, have we evolved our structures which will deliver something? And if we have not, how do we go about doing it? I think, uh, though we had a very, very interesting talk, I'm sorry that uh, uh, I took you this into a different direction. But uh, well, listen. <laughs> uh, but in the end, at all levels, all levels, I have been going and asking. I went to Punjab University and asked the same question. I went to the 
went to IIT Kanpur and asked social scientists the same question. Nobody is asking, we are not, there's no reason to uh, change any ideologies. I don't even know what, an, what ideology means. Uh, uh, the re but there is a reason to engage with India as an Indian. And uh, have, can we do that? Should we not be doing that? That is, uh, and uh, as uh, ICSSR, we'll try to raise these questions with you. We'll call the social scientists, raise these kind of questions. Whatever the ICSR as an apex organization can do for this purpose and provide whatever help, that we, we will certainly try to do. But we have to start moving. Uh, maybe uh, we'll have to start from scratch, the way Vikram, Bhai, uh, Vikram Sarabhai started in 1960s. But uh, we have to, or maybe we have a sufficiently large corpus of work and sufficient, uh, which we just need to put together in a way that it amounts to a new vision, a new culture of social sciences in India. Uh, Having said that, uh, uh, let us once again thank uh, uh, Dada Krishnanji, uh, not only for giving his, this talk, but also for being such a great scientist and such a great uh, nationalist and having served India so well for this long. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, may, uh, I had. Uh, Hope that uh, uh, Shri Parampujani, uh, Murliminor Joshi ji, our beach hai, or uh, uh, as uh, uh, he would have told, he, he has overseen the science uh, in India. He has also been a scientist, but he has also overseen science. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a very very rare uh, when he was the Minister of Education, Minister of Science, Minister of Space, and uh, uh, there was one more, uh, Minister of Ocean Studies. Uh, ocean, ocean. Uh, I and he was able to, I think he, what he tells me, he was able to go to various scientific institutions of India and was able to uh, engage the scientists uh, for them encouraging them, uh, wanting them to, to integrate their activities and, and put all of this together in a way that it amounts something for the nation. And for that, I think we will have to be, uh, we must be uh, eternally uh, in that indebted to him. We have very few people of that character. Thank you, sir, for being. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking remarks. I now request Chairman, sir, to felicitate the chief guest with a memento. Uh, the memento that we are giving him is a book uh, uh, of uh, lectures uh, uh, given by Sri Murlimro Joshi ji, and which I have had the good fortune to edit. And I think there's much about space in this. So uh, how do we?
I request my colleague, Dr. Aditi Bapte, to please come forward and present the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vranda. As James Allen had rightly said, no duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks. It is my deep privilege to extend a heartfelt vote of thanks to Radha Krishnan, sir, for gracing us with your august presence at the ICSSR ACUM lecture. Your eloquent words truly truly transported us through 60 years of space voyage that we witnessed as a country and will further see in the coming years. Uh, you also told us that a shared vision for betterment of humanity with transparency, trust, and working as a team is the recipe for not just success, rather I would say legacy. Special thanks to Padma Vibhushan Murli Manohar Joshi, sir, for your blessings. Special thanks to our dear chairman, sir, for always being our guiding light, and without whom the ICSR ACUM lecture series wouldn't be a reality. Thank you so much, sir. We are also thankful to Professor Deepak Kumar Shivastav, Honorable Member Secretary ICSSR for his constant support. Gratitude to all luminaries and social scientists for their active participation and making this lecture series a meaningful one. Until we meet for the next ACOM lecture, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, in a way, slightly remote. I was also, he was teaching physics and laboratory.